Hi friends, today we will discuss metal stenosis. Before going to metal stenosis, we will discuss some basic concept about metal wall itself. So, metal wall is a bicuspid wall. So, it has two cusps. One is anterior, the other one is posterior. So, we should know location of the mitral wall. It is located between the left atria and the left ventricle. So, this is the location of the mitral wall. So, what is the importance of mitral wall? It prevents backflow of blood during systole. So, when there is a systole, the blood pumps which pump from the ventricle, it doesn't go back to the atria. That is how it prevents. So, what happens in mitral stenosis? So, we should understand first thing, what is stenosis? <coughs> stenosis is nothing but narrowing of the wall space. So, when there is a narrowing, there is no enough space for blood to move from left atria to left ventricle. So, I am going to discuss along with etiology, pathogenesis also. Generally, most commonly, mitral stenosis is due to rheumatic diseases. And in elderly people, due to calcification of the wall and congenital. So, when you take this any of the abnormalities, what happens when there is a calcification and fibrosis and fibrosis? What happens? This causes decreased movement of the valves. Leaflets. Leaflets. So, what are these leaflets? Leaflets are nothing but the two cusps of the valve. When there is a decreased movement of these valves, the space is narrowed, which causes decreased flow from. <laughs> left atria to left ventricle. So, when there is a decreased flow of blood from left atria to left ventricle, what happens in left atria, there is an increased pressure. So, what atria does, when there is an increased pressure, it has to compensate itself to push more blood from the atria to ventricle. So, what it causes, dilation everything every changes whatever happening in the atria or ventricle causes one or the other symptom remember this so when there is a dilation it can cause atrial fibrillation and as this dilation progresses what happens as a compensatory mechanism it also causes increased pulmonary pressure i mean the pulmonary hypertension pulmonary hypertension. So, when there is a pulmonary hypertension, when there is a left ventricular dilation itself, it has two possibilities. It can cause pulmonary hypertension or it can cause pulmonary edema. It is not left ventricular dilation itself causing the pulmonary edema. When there is a dilation of the left atria, what it happens? The resistance in the pulmonary vessels decreases. When there is a compensatory mechanism, if pulmonary vessels compensate really good to the dilation and increase pressure, it causes pulmonary hypertension. When there is no proper compensation of the blood vessels from the pulmonary system, it causes pulmonary edema. So, we understood what are the symptoms which can happen. So, when there is a pulmonary hypertension, in contrast, the vessels which come are connected to the right side of the heart, I mean pulmonary circulation. So, this pulmonary hypertension can damage right side of the heart. So, it causes right ventricular hypertrophy also. So, we will discuss the symptoms. So, how I, I will explain you with every symptom why it is happening. So, symptoms include breathlessness,
फेटिक एदेमा ascites it can cause the thromboembolic complications it can also cause chest pain i will explain why each and every symptom will come it can cause hematosis it can cause palpitations so now i am going to explain each and every symptom why it is coming so first i'll explain why fatigue and breathlessness comes so let's take a person with mitral stenosis for example he undergoes a vigorous physical activity so when he undergoes a physical vigorous activity what happens he needs more oxygen to uh, reach his demand of the oxygen body demand so when they, there is a more oxygen demand it causes the breathlessness but why breathlessness because there is no enough blood coming from left atria to left ventricle but cardiac output decreased still he needs more oxygen that is why it is caused so these symptoms are due to decreased cardiac output so why edema and ascites because i explained previously there is a right ventricular failure and right ventricular hypertrophy it will cause ascites and edema so this is right heart failure and why thromboembolic complications because see there is some structure in atria called appendages this is a sac like structure what happens when there is a right atrial dilation the storage of the blood will lead to the stasis and it causes the thromboembolism to push into the blood stream so it is due to blood stasis so why chest pain because thromboembolic symptoms will cause chest pain and hematosis i explained you earlier why pulmonary edema comes and pulmonary hypertension when there is a patient is having uh, hematosis it will uh, it is due to the pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary edema why he will have palpitations because palpitations are due to atrial dilation and it causes i explained you atrial fibrillation can happen during the dilation so that dilation is leading to the palpitation symptoms so we found the patient with these symptoms we have to start diagnosing the patient why he is having all these symptoms so first we will start with physical examination i mean signs what are all found in these patients so signs so signs what are all found in this patient i am going to tell you each and every sign what happens the patient will have atrial fibrillation atrial fibrillation because dilation of the atrium the patient can when you auscultate the patient he will have mid diastolic murmur remember mid diastolic murmur is a important thing and when you auscultate the patient lung he will have crepitations why crepitation due to pulmonary edema and pulmonary venous congestion it will cause crepitations and when you see these signs you have to diagnose this patient there is a scheme of diagnosis in cardiology we go with ecg we do echo what is echo echocardiograph it is a method by ultrasound we see the movement of the valves and movement of the uh, uh, ventricles and atrium we do chest x ray and we do doppler studies so 
what we see in ecg ecg we can see two symptoms that is right ventricular hypertrophy and atrial fibrillation and echocardiography when you do echocardiography you can see the movement of the valves the movement of the valves will be definitely diminished and when you take chest x ray you can see two things one is pulmonary edema and right atrial appendages so the dilation of the right atrial appendages can be seen on chest x ray and when you do a doppler study it shows us some pressure gradients what are the pressure differences between the atria and ventricle so that we can correct the condition so we diagnose a patient we have to treat the patient with the mitral stenosis so how do we treat the patient with mitral stenosis so treatment includes two options one is medical management and surgical so i i'm going to explain you first the medical management medical management it just doesn't like you know we can't change any structural changes but we can only do decrease the rate we can decrease the load on the heart and we can use diuretics so how we like what is the use of the diuretics it causes decrease of the edema by decreasing water content so how do we control the rate we control the rate by beta blockers and load can also be controlled by diuretics and this rate controlling can also be done by calcium channel blockers i mean calcium channel blockers are a group of drugs like which also affect the rate now we have surgical because we are just doing a medical management we are nowhere resolving exact the uh, etiology for the mitral stenosis so surgical treatment includes two two possibilities valvuloplasty and valve replacement so what is valvuloplasty valvuloplasty there is a method called balloon valvuloplasty in this percutaneous intervention through the big vessels we go to the heart then we go to the mitral valve we dilate a balloon in there so that the valves whatever the cusps was attached due to the fibrosis and calcification we divide that attachment so that there is a free flow and valve replacement it it what it itself says what we do there and before doing valvuloplasty we should think we should consider about the age of the patient we should consider which type of valve to choose and we should consider the size of the mitral valve generally normal size of the mitral valve i mean normal orifice mitral valve is it is about 5 cm square during diastole so when there is a <coughs> decrease of the orifice up to 2 cm square or less than 2 cm square patient can be asymptomatic why he can be asymptomatic he may have physical signs but he never goes to a doctor but he will think like he may get palpitations and the minor symptoms he will think i am just weak or something like that why when it is considered severe if it is less than 1 cm square when this is called a severe condition so here along with medical management we should do surgical treatment to resolve the condition so this is about mitral stenosis thank you